Hello and welcome to Retech and today we're going to have a look at the Oric computers again not in the same way as we've done before because we have had a look at the Oric one and the Oric Atmos in a previous video and we're just going to remind you of a little bit of that in the moment but this video is kind of a a look at how when you get this technology this old classic technology that in some cases is 40 or 50 years old depending on the model we now become kind of curators of that technology we become the historians of that technology and the caretakers of that technology because it's a piece of equipment that has not been produced for many many years and was only in a short production run even when it was produced because you have to remember most 8-bit micros were only produced for in some cases a matter of months in the case of the Mattel Aquarius and in other cases such as the ZX Spectrum at the original ZX Spectrum has very very small window of about three years and then you have the likes of the Auric 1 and the Auric Atmos and again a very small production run combined production run of only a couple of years in total now this means that if you own one of these machines um, you've kind of got to get to grips of them going wrong and failing now the Oric 1 the original Oric machine as in the original 8-bit micro was um, a machine that is fairly reliable and its shortcomings made it reliable its membrane style keyboard made the machine reliable and it's not a bad machine you wouldn't want to type on it for too long but at the end of the day it's designed to be a very cheap 8-bit micro in fact most of the microcomputers possibly with the exception of the BBC micro in the UK and notable others around the world most of these machines were meant to be very cheap accessible affordable now this auric atmos which you've seen in another video especially with the erebus adapter the um, basically emulates a disk drive and cassette drive on these machines is a very handy machine and it's nice to explore because as i said they weren't produced for, for that long and there are quite decent little models especially with a, a nice little keyboard on like these machines but the keyboard is kind of its shortfall and um, the problem with the kind of keyboards that they put on these machines is they were made very very cheaply not in the same way as the BBC micro keyboard was made it was a very I wouldn't say massively expensive keyboard but it was very very well done and it wasn't as cheap and cheerful as the keyboards they used on certain micros including the Dragon 32, the Auric machines and a lot of other 8-bit micros that were out there and they tend to fail and it's not just the key switches that fail the actual PCB fails and we're going to take a quick look at what was once a working machine and we're going to find out what made it fail so let's have a quick look so we have an Auric Atmos and uh, it looks okay it looks like it's working properly but when we touch any of the keys it really doesn't do a lot you, you kind of get random fluctuations across the screen but that's about it we have uh, an issue with the keyboard and it doesn't matter what you press on the keyboard itself you 
you start getting those random pattern fluctuations every now and again you'll get a beep from the key where it registers something but that's about it and that's where we are with this once working and practically unmarked Auric Atmos and as you can see from the previous video it's, um, it's basically the successor to the Auric one it was only around for about a year I mean this machine is one year in its kind of sales and it's roughly the same as the original Auric One. They were both only out in the market for a year each. The Auric One, I think because of its um, keyboard, um, it wasn't well liked and also had bugs in its tape loading system and then they decided to upgrade that to the Auric Atmos. I mean basically it is very very similar and it's almost identical spec and it's almost identical hardware. The The biggest difference is if you have a look at the Auric one behind it is the keyboard. The keyboard is the initial difference on both these machines on the Auric Atmos you actually have a very very nice full travel keyboard and it's it's actually all right it's um a proper key switched keyboard very much in the vein of the texas instruments ti9948 and it's a world away from the plastic membrane style keyboard that the Auric One has, but under the skin they are very, very similar machines. They're both, or these two models are both 48K. They both have virtually the same internals. They both have virtually the same processors. They have virtually the same chips and interfaces on board. They have virtually the same everything. In fact, you can swap the case from the Auric Atmos into the Auric One quite happily. They are literally that compatible and that much of the same machine. So why do it? Why go from the Auric One to the Auric Atmos after such a short period of time that the Auric One was out? It's not as if we hadn't had strange keyboards before with, you know, the ZX81, ZX Spectrum, Mattel Aquarius, and a whole host of other machines with different keyboards. I mean, at the time, most people weren't that worried about it they would have got on quite happily with this keyboard and thought nothing of it and thought well it was just part of the machine and that wouldn't really have affected sales of this machine and it was quite a good contender to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum 6502 processors in both both running at roughly one megahertz they're very very much of their time it was a perfectly functioning machine and it's just been sat in a box for a little while um, and I've decided to pull it out and use it and this is what happened but again you've got to remember these machines are upwards of 40 plus years old and they were never designed to last this long they were pretty cheaply made and because of that they're kind of suffering a little bit in old age so Let's take a look at exactly what's gone on with this keyboard and how it was repaired. Now you can see the keyboard's now out of the machine and um, it looks okay. It looks fine. But this row of keys in this kind of part of the matrix fails. So when you used A, F, E, C and X they weren't responding the way they should have been responding and the same goes for keys on this side of the matrix and they originally started to fail very intermittently so you'd press A and you press it a few times and then all of a sudden the character would appear so originally it felt like the actual key switch and I didn't think too much of it at the time I thought okay I'll take that apart and clean it and you know make sure it's got some contact cleaner on and service it and so on but then 
other parts of the matrix started to do exactly the same. And it kind of dawned on me that it wasn't really a key switch issue because the key switches themselves feel okay and uh, they're not starting to get stiff, they're not starting to feel a bit clunky under fingers and all this kind of thing, which the giveaway is you can actually start feeling them when you press the key down, it's not smooth and the, the actual key switch starts to lose its kind of connection and it starts dragging on the key. So didn't feel like that kind of issue and then once it started losing part of its um, key switches or keystrokes on this side of the keyboard that's when it got a bit worrying and I decided to take the machine apart because the the keyboard was effectively unusable. So you can kind of see on the back of this PCB um, a lot of wires and that's because the actual tracks on here was starting to lift. Some of them were starting to lift and crack on this area and um, basically what happened is is that the, the tracks themselves were not creating a very good connection but on the matrix itself and also once I start having a look at it the the actual connector here that went into here was also starting to fail and the tracks in between there were starting to lift. There wasn't really any sign of corrosion on the board but it was starting to gently lift. So that's what the problem was. So the only way to fix this is to either produce a brand new PCB get another, or get another keyboard, swap everything over, put all the key switches in and so on or you have to then start tracing back each individual connection and then rather than bring it up to a header that's actually starting to fail you need to put a new header on the end of a ribbon cable and this is how I decided to do it. Once the keyboard's in the case all of these cables lie flat anyway and that's the only way you have to do it. So really what you're doing here is following each individual track all the way back to where the original header was. And it's time consuming. It, it is very time consuming. But what you need to do first is you need to find out if there's any other damage to the, the keyboard itself. Because once part of the traces and tracks start to lift. There are only little copper wires. That's all that's left. Okay. And the way these are made is you get basically a piece of copper and then there's an overlay. Very simple terms. Um, if you haven't done one of these before, you get an overlay of the traces which goes onto the copper and then it's put into an etch bath and what happens is all of the copper that isn't actually covered by your tracks that you've designed gets eaten away. Once you've taken it out of the bath, rinsed it, you're left with the tracks and the mask is whichever colour they use is put over the top to kind of protect the tracks and traces really. And that's the basics of how these are formed but you're left with very very thin copper strips and over time they do start to delaminate from the board itself the either the fiberglass or whatever you're using is your baseboard and that's what happens they start to crack over time remember if you have a look at one of these they twist around very easily and they are very very flexible and over time of tapping on the keys it twists this board all the time very gently and also the vibrations from the keys travel through the board and then eventually they start to break down so I'm guessing this was quite a well used machine in its kind of early lifespan. Now the Auric Atmos wasn't produced for that long, so getting spares for one of these takes a lot of searching. 
there, there are a lot of dead machines on eBay that, well, not a lot, but there are dead machines that come up now and again on eBay. You know, um, untested, they say, dead, basically. They have plugged it in. Most people have tried them. They couldn't get it to work, but they list it as untested. So you have to be aware that most times when it says untested, it means pretty much dead. And mo a lot of the times it's failing keyboards. So you have to really take your time if you want to repair one of these, because basically once it's all back together and the the ribbons trimmed, the cables trimmed, a new connector header is soldered onto here and then connected to the PCB, well, this will work just like it was meant to be. And we have the original Auric One PCB here. And just here is basically the, the header. So you need a female connector to go onto this. And that's basically it. You know, the actual board's quite simple. I and mean, have repaired one of these in the past. They're not too difficult to repair. But um, really, generally, sometimes the only way of doing or getting one of these to work is to do some DIY, basically. It might not be pretty underneath. And it might not, you know, be as nice looking as the, the original back of the keyboard but you're not going to see it when the case is on and sometimes it's the only option you have is to literally get the soldering iron out and make some repairs on the back which is exactly what has been going on here now be aware it's not a five minute job because you have to spend time tracing every one of these connections back, finding out where the break is, and then resoldering new jumper points onto either the track, because where the actual pin header or the jumper point was corroded, and you have to make a solder through joint, or you connect it to one of the original solder points, the solder joints, the bottom of the key, the key switch itself and then take it back to the header. So either way, it's time consuming and it takes a lot of effort. Some people might say, why don't you wait until the original keyboard comes up on a that dead or damaged machine? Well, most of the time, it's not the actual board itself that's starting to fail, it's the keyboard. And the amount of machines that I got and had where the keyboards failed in one form or other, whether it's the controller chip itself or it's the key switches or it's tracks lifting off the back of the keyboard in the same way this one has. Well, the only option you do have sometimes is to repair them. So with the actual machine back together and screwed together, it does fit quite nice. You can tell when you put the case on, it's a little tighter in places because it's got those extra wires behind the keyboard. But overall, it works. It's nice enough. So let's um, just power it on and have a quick look. Okay, so we have the keyboard. And as, as I press the keys, you can actually hear it working. The keyboards on these machines were never fantastically fast reacting but and it, it works fine so it's worth the effort to actually just spend some time soldering up the keyboards and at the end of the day we've got an, an a working auric atmos still with most of its original components most of its original PCB the way it came out of the factory, but now it's actually got um, a working keyboard, which is nice. Now, what does it cost to repair that? Well, the ribbon cable itself, it was just a piece of ribbon cable, it cost about four pounds or something or thereabouts. Um, it was solder, virtually free, and time. That's all it was, time. And... You know, it might take you a few hours 
it might take you a day or so to repair a keyboard but it's worth it because it keeps one of these classic machines working now I've got another Atmos which um, I've had for a while and um, it's more kind of original than this one because it hasn't had the repairs but you wouldn't know side by side whether it was repaired or not and that's the whole point that is definitely the whole point of doing this because you end up with a working machine so we're going to use the the Erebus system to load a quick game just to show you it actually working so here we go and this is the Oric Atmos running and you know it's fine it it wasn't a bad machine overall it wasn't um, a terrible machine I still think that as I said before the the Oric one was kind of a more stylized machine it was more stylized in the way the original ZX Spectrum was kind of stylized but you know they're, they're both literally the same machine there's very little to choose between them they still had cassette loading problems they still had verify problems they, even when they try to improve it on the the Atmos with the second generation ROMs it still had those issues generally they were never the most reliable machines as far as cassette loading and saving and verifying was concerned but with the the use of an an adapter such as the Auric Erebus or any other um, tape drive or SD version of a tape drive or disk drive and so on makes these machines much much more useful and much better to use and as you can see it runs everything the way it should do and there you go it's running and you can see it wasn't massively a graphically capable machine but you know it was of its time so you've had a quick look at the Oric Atmos with me and you probably noticed that it's had a little bit of a repair no it's actually had a lot of repair work and after I did that side of the keyboard I had to work my way around the traces on the other side it wasn't so many there was about four or five and that was before I could put the machine together and show you it working now all in all it possibly took about four hours worth of work to trace every track back and make sure the the new jumper wires were actually going to the right parts of the track and to the right components and to the right solder joint and so on but at the end of the day it was worth doing and as you can see on the background everything works the way it should do which is the way it should be but as I keep saying to people these um, these classic machines they're getting older now and more and more are coming up for sale as failures um, there's a lot of un untested as you see on eBay and other places where you find these machines for sale so do be prepared to work on them and also do prepare yourself for failures prepare yourself for the machines to actually just stop working from literally one day to the next now I enjoyed fixing this machine and it was nice to get it running and it was a bit of fun and um, I think the Auric One and the Auric Atmos are kind of very underrated machines and I also think that they could have been a very big rival to the ZX Spectrum but unfortunately Tangerine Micros who produced the Auric, the Auric Atmos and the Auric One kind of really didn't survive very well in the cutthroat environment of the early to mid 1980s 
and if I unplug this machine as well these machines have a significant legacy with Cambridge and uh, not many people realize that the the original kind of outfit for the tangerine computers um, was really up in Ely which is not far outside of Cambridge itself but they had a distribution center and research and offices in Cambridge city center and one of them was on Techno Park and as we work our way to a small very tidy very neat industrial area this is where another computer company at the time called Tangerine Micros brought out the Oric One and this was on Techno Park and then they later followed it up with the Oric Atmos and these were their distribution and offices and it's only a stone's throw from all of the other technology companies that were set up in the area at the time and the other one was literally probably three minutes walk away from where I am and it, it varies from model to model until they moved part of their distribution service they were actually based in Cambridge itself and the um, on the back of every machine that you have a postcode and it's CB1 that building is now a gym as far as I can see but it was quite a big building and again there is legacy of most of the 8-bit era in and around Cambridge it's quite weird how that kind of happened it was kind of all span from one city which is quite amazing when you think about it but that makes the legacy of these machines more important to try and keep whether it is an Auric, a BBC, a ZX Spectrum, Newbury which produced the New Brain and there are just dozens of small outfits that have gone by the by at one stage there was apparently 600 manufacturers of computers in the UK 600 independent computer manufacturers that's a lot but that was in a massively short span of time you're looking at a span of time that really lasted about six years it's not a long time is it okay so thanks for watching and thanks for following me on my auric atmos legacy and hopefully this machine is going to be good for a long time to come i probably will produce a, a brand new pcb for this keyboard um because in the long term it's possibly going to be the better fix but this was to get the machine working in the short to medium term and when i get a little bit of time i will sketch the um the actual pcb and then try and make a copy so Thanks for watching and hope you subscribe and I'll see you soon. Thank you.